Good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to our midweek service here, or midweek taping at Family Worship Center. And uh, it's uh, getting to be a beautiful time of year. It's fall. Of the, fall is just around the corner. The leaves will start turning pretty colors, and the temperature will be just right, and football will be played. You can see that I've got my Chiefs shirt on tonight, just kind of just kind of getting ready for the season. I think uh, first ball game starts this week. And that's not real spiritual, but I just thought I'd throw that in tonight so you'd know where we're at and why I was wearing this shirt. Amen. But tonight I want to talk about uh, something about, I'll give you the title and we'll read the scripture, Dagon, the fish god. Have you ever heard about that before? Well, we'll get there in just a moment. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of, the, of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. And when they, when they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face and to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him back in his place again. And when they arose early in the morning, tomorrow morning, behold, Dagon had fallen upon his face on the ground before the Lord again, and his, and the head of Dagon and both of his palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon this. Father, we just ask today, God, that you will bring your blessing, your anointing through your word to our hearts and help us, God, to learn to call upon you and depend upon you alone, that you are the one true living God. Amen. Amen. This title sounds like some kind of a, uh, a mythological story, and it kind of is, because the uh, Philistines, as well as all those ungodly nations, had many, many gods. And the Hebrew, uh, this Dagon, was, uh, it means the fish god. Now, I have no idea any further than that what that really means, that uh, but uh, that's what they call it. So that's why I call this Dagon the fish god. And uh, so we, we saw here that uh, that uh, judgment came upon Dagon there because of that. But let's back up just a little bit and find out that judgment comes upon the house of God uh, and the priest and his family. We go back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we see that young Samuel had just come to the, um, the uh, house of God to live with uh, uh, the priest there and his family and uh, Eli. And so he's there, and we we find out that uh, as he's living there that God speaks to him in the night. And, uh, of course, Samuel didn't know what it was, so he gets up and he runs into Eli's bed where he's sleeping. And he says, says, yes, did did you call me? He says, no, I didn't call you. So he says, go back and lay down. So Samuel goes back, lays down, he hears his voice again. And Samuel, and so he gets up one more time, runs into uh, Eli's room there. And he said, did you call me? He said, no. He said, go back and, and uh, uh, lay down. And if you hear the voice again, say, yes, Lord, what is it you want? So he's laying there sleeping, and all of a sudden the voice comes again, Samuel. And he says, yes, Lord. And God begins to speak to him. And begins to give him a description of what is about to happen to the nation of Israel. Because Israel had become very ungodly. Eli, the priest, had allowed his sons, Hoph and I and Phinehas, to, to run and rule the temple there in Shiloh. And they were very ungodly individuals. They, uh, uh, they I won't even get into it, all kinds of illicit, ungodly activities taking place in the temple. They weren't men of God at all, but yet they had that position uh, to uh, maintain and run the the temple. So uh, God spoke this to Samuel. And so when he came back in to Eli, Eli said, what did he say? And well, Samuel Samuel didn't want to tell him. I mean, this is a very devastating thing that uh, that God's going to cause judgment to come upon the house of God. And uh, so he finally says, no matter what God told you, he said, I want you to tell me uh, what, what happened. And uh, so he told him what's going to happen. There's going to be a devastation and death come to uh, the, the house of God there and to Eli and to his families. Amen. And uh, 
uh, it, it gives a description of of uh, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, in First Samuel two twelve. It says, "Now these sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord." The word Belial means uh, the sons of Satan. They were they were worthless individual, and uh, they had desecrated the temple. And God reached a place where he was fed up with it, and he told uh, Samuel that he's going to bring it to an end. And so when we see here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, the end is near. We see that this time Israel went to war with the Philistines, and the Philistines attacked Israel, and they killed 4,000 uh, men and defeated the army. And uh, so Israel begins to wonder, now why, why did this happen? Because we have the Ark of the Covenant. We have the Ten Commandments. That that was where they housed the Ten Commandments. Uh, it was it was basically this. It was a box uh, that was uh, made according to the standard of God's measurement, and in that they put the ten, the ten, ten Commandments. In other words, they put the law in there, uh, the presence of God. So, in in a sense of the word, you could say that Israel had God in this box. And usually, wherever this box was, whoever had the the uh, Ark of the Covenant, uh, God's protection would be uh, upon them. And so, as they had the Ark of the Covenant there, when they were defeated by the by the four thousand uh, men, uh, they began to wonder, well, why did God let this happen to Israel? We are the ones that possess the Ark of the Covenant. That should shouldn't have been. Well, there's a little message in all of this that people kind of have a tendency today to think that they can do what they want as long as they claim the name of God, that God's going to protect them. Well, I've got a little saying I throw in with that. God's not going to bless your mess. Now, I want you to think about that. Too many people want to live the way they want to and still expect God's blessing to be upon their life. I run across it all the time. People that don't even claim to be Christians, but yet they expect God to bring blessing into their life. I've had people call me that were living uh, in sin, living ungodly lives, uh, committing adultery, doing drugs, doing alcohol, and they'll call me and say, oh, pastor, would you pray for me and my boyfriend? Would you would you pray for us that God will uh, cause a miracle to take place in our life? God would, that would, God would bless me. And, and uh, you know, my, my thought is this, why should God bless you when the lifestyle that you're living is totally, completely opposite of what God has instructed you to live? And so that's where Israel was right now. They had come to this place to where uh, they were expecting God to bless them. And so, so they go to Shiloh and they bring the Ark of the Covenant uh, into the battle with them. They thought if they would get the, the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple, bring it to them when they went into battle, they just take the Ark of the Covenant with them. And they just thought that, uh, man, this is going to bring, surely bring success to our armies. Amen. And everybody knew what it was. Everybody knew it was the ark. And, and when Israel saw that the ark had come into the camp, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5, it said they shouted. They shouted so loud that the earth shook because they, they just knew that God was able to give them victory over their enemies because he had done it many, many times before. But he did it when Israel was worshiping God, when they were serving God. And now they've drifted far away from him. They just assume that all it takes to have victory in your life is to have God in a box. And there's so many people today that feel that same way, that they think if they can get God in the box, if they can keep God in their house, put him upon a shelf, and if they ever need him, they'll bring him down. And that's the way a lot of people act. So uh, they, they were expecting God's hand of protection without repentance, no change in their lives, still allowing sin to continue. They, they remembered what God could do for his people uh, who were right with him. So they remembered. They remembered what God can do. And why do will people do that today? Will they, will they remember what God can do? If God did it in the past, God could do it again, but he does it under his circumstance and under his, his way of doing things. And it's not in the middle of your sinful mess, come out from amongst that mess. Humble yourself in the sight of God. Let God be real in your life, and you're going to find the blessings of God will then come upon you. And uh, they, they were like the people who were glad that God was there in their time of need. They, 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 they didn't uh, want God any other time. Uh, you know, just when we need him is when they wanted him. They, they were perfectly content for leaving him in Shiloh in the temple, 
They were living their life of ungodliness and sin, going into the battle, expecting the back of victory to be just because uh, at a previous time, at a previous location, uh, they had God in their lives. And hang on to that thought right there. At a previous time, at a previous location, where were you with God? Where you were with God in years gone by, 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe two weeks ago. Doesn't mean that's where you are with God right now. God is a current God. And God is something that we need to keep current in our lives. Our relationship with Him needs to be current. It needs to be updated, up to date. We need to, to be where we need to be with God on a continual basis. And we find out that Israel thought that everything might be okay because now they had God in their camp. And 1 Samuel 4 and 7 says, Now when the Philistines heard the shouting of the Israelite camp and found out it was because the ark had been brought into their camp, they panicked. Uh, they, they said this, We've never faced anything like this before. They also have heard, had heard about how mighty God was and how the, the miracles that he had done for his nation of Israel. And, and they also knew this. So they also associated that, oh, now the Ark of the Covenant is in the camp of the Israel of Israelite. And so they just assumed that, that their days were numbered. They, they just assumed that, that they, they were, uh, their battle was going to be defeated. They were going to lose because uh, God was in the camp of the Israelites. And uh, they cried out, who can save us from the hand of, of the mighty God of Israel? And, and they used the little G, not the big G. They didn't understand uh, what God was really all about. Amen. But the enemy they had, uh, as the enemy, they had great understanding and reverence to God because uh, they had heard and they knew. And they knew that their only hope was this, to fight as if they had never fought before to give it everything they had against Israel and their God. And just uh, if didn't, they knew if they didn't, they would become slaves to Israel. They would be defeated. And so they went into battle with that attitude, we, we've got to try. We've got to try. Let's give it to the Philistines for that effort. You know, how many times do we not try? And, and maybe, maybe the victory could be ours. We would try, but we don't even try. Well, they went into the battle and they wound up killing 30 thousand soldiers. So the Philistines won in that battle. They defeated Israel and God was in the camp. And so they thought, wow, why don't we take the Ark of the Covenant? And because they knew that if God was good for Israel, if they had God in the midst of their camp, they also would be a great nation and be able to, to fight uh, mighty battles and, and have the miracles take place that God <clears throat> had done in their lives previous to that. But there's a whole lot more to victory than having God in the box. I just want to stop right there and talk a little bit about us today. You know, if, if all you have is God in a box for an occasional use when you get into trouble, you don't have much of a relationship with God. I, I hope that he's your constant companion, that, that you want to be with him and want to be around him and want to serve him every day, even in the time when there is no trouble. In the times when you have no need. And uh, there's an old song we used to sing. It said, or it was a special song that people sang. It said, I didn't come here, Lord, to ask you for anything. I just came to talk with you, Lord. I didn't come here because I wanted to get something from you, God. I just come here because I love you. And I want to fellowship with you. And I want to receive just the presence of your Holy Spirit. And you know, what kind of relationship do you have with your, with your spouse? What kind of relationship do you have with your kids? If the only time you get together is when you need something from each other. That's not much of a relationship. Aren't you glad there are times you can just sit down together and enjoy each other's presence? That's the way life should be with you and your spouse and your family and, and people that you know. Shouldn't be just when I, I need, so therefore I'll come and see you. And that's the way we need to be with our relationship with God. We don't need just to talk to God or read his book or uh, get with him when we need something, but we just need to get with him to feel his presence. Can I tell you, I tell you this, there's, there's no greater experience than to feel the presence and the glory of God. 
So there was a lot more to this victory than just having God in a box. Well, the Philistines, they didn't know that. They didn't understand. And they were so proud that they had captured God and put him in the temple of Dagon and uh, beside the statue of Dagon, the fish god. That doesn't even sound like an enticing title to me. Dagon was in the Hebrew tongue. It said it meant the fish god. And so they put the almighty god on a shelf beside this fish god. That in itself, to me, is a is a slap in the face. Well, they 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 were waking up. Uh, they woke up the next morning, and I don't know if they thought that Dagon and and uh, the real God would get along, and they would link up together, and then they'd have two gods that they could depend upon. I don't know what their thinking was, but it was totally wrong. You know, that's the way the world thinks. They think, you know, if I can just keep what I've got, put a little bit of God with it, I can really do all right. Well, that's the wrong way of thinking. You need to lay whatever down that you're depending upon for your God now. Your God may be a lot of different things that you worship, and you want to keep that. Yeah, I want God too. I, I still want to worship my, my idol, whatever it might be. I want God too. That doesn't work that way. You either serve God or you don't. And you don't link God up with some other feeble thing of people's imagination and expect that God and something else is going to be enough. No, God doesn't need something else to be enough in your life. If you have God, there simply you have enough. Amen. And, and so we see there that they did this the next morning. They came in and they found Dagon laying on the, on the ground face down. Well, I don't know what they thought that night. They said, well, maybe just, you know, something happened and blew him off the shelf. So they picked Dagon back up and put him back on the shelf. Now, isn't that the kind of God you want? You want the kind of God that you can pick up and place here and place there and, and uh, that doesn't ever speak, doesn't ever do anything? Or do you want the God that created the universe? Do you want the God that can cause the Red Sea to open wide up? Do you want a God that can cause the sun to stop? Do you want a God that can cause nations to win battles? Do you want a God that, that can feed you when there's nothing to be fed with? Do you want a God that can cause water to come out of the rock and you can drink from it? There's a big difference in the God of Israel and the God of the Philistines, the fish God and all of the other fake gods that they had. And so they put him back on the shelf. Next morning come in, God said, I've got to bring a, bring a greater message to them to make them to understand this is not going to work. And so this morning they came in, they found that Dagon laying on the ground, his head had bust, busted off and his hands had busted off and nothing but a stump left. And so they realized this wasn't going to work and they realized that they probably better take uh, uh, the, the ark to someplace else. And so they picked the Philistines up. They took the uh, ark up and uh, the whole Philistine people began to realize that uh, they were in trouble. And every place they took uh, the ark of the covenant, uh, tumors began to break out on all the people. They began to have these sores and these tumors that would break out upon them and and so they would take him from one place and they'd say, get him out of here. We, we don't want this. And, and every place they would take him, they would find out that tumors would break upon the people. And this is just plain blatantly saying to them, don't you understand? God is not something you can possess. God is not something you can have in a box. God is not something you can have control. God is something you ask to come into your heart and into your life. And you live according to his standards, not bringing God into your standards. And so they, they do this and they realize that they have, to, uh, they have to get rid of God. So eventually they take God uh, back to the Israelites and they give God back because uh, and there's a big story behind that too, that they realize as long as they kept God in a box, they were going to have trouble. And uh, there's so many people like that today that just simply think God is... Uh, well, let's put it this way. They want God to fit into their form of living. They don't want to fit into God's form of living. So therefore, they, they have problems with that. So the society that we live in today uh, is, is much like that. Second Timothy 3 and verse 5 says, The people in the last days, when as time goes on, uh, more and more wickedness is going to arise amongst the nations uh, in, in, the, in the land in which we live. 
Wickedness is just going to, is arising in society as a whole, even creeping into the churches to where people will become godly and just accepting uh, just a little bit of God instead of the fullness of God. And so uh, Paul tells us here, he said, in the last days, well, first of all, he says in uh, first this, first, uh, Second Timothy 3 and verse 1, in the last days perilous times shall come. Men should be lovers of their own selves and, and all kinds of ungodly things that they, they, want to, they want to be God. They want to do it their way. And he come down to verse 5 says, They will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And that's the world we live in today. So many people today. But it don't have to be. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, I, I think I'm really living at a time right now where I'm enjoying God as much right now as I have in quite some time. I tell you, I am enjoying reading my Bible. I'm enjoying praying. I'm enjoying coming to church and worshiping God. I'm enjoying studying His Word. I tell you, it's exciting to me. I wake up every morning looking forward to the opportunity to spend some time with God. This is not something I do on Sunday. This is something I do every day of my life, seven days a week, 365 days a year, I look forward to getting up and spending time with God because I don't want God to be in a box. I want to be in, uh, in the box and let God take care of me. And he said, but unfortunately in the last days, people will get so wrapped up in the things of this world, they won't have time for God. Oh, they'll want to resemble Christians. They'll want to resemble like they're doing something right, having a form of godliness, they may look a little bit godly. They may look a little bit like Christians, but they deny the trueness of God. They deny God and his power, and they want nothing to do with it. They don't want the real God. They want just a, a false God. Maybe a Dagon the fish God is what they're wanting. I don't know. And uh, uh, people want God because they want the benefit of being a Christian. They know and they understand that the true Christians are blessed by God, so they want that. They, they want that blessings. Uh, uh, they, they like to make people think they're Christians because that's, that's respectable, you know. Yes, I'm a Christian. I, I, I love God. And, uh, but while making this statement, they're still living with their lives unchanged. Uh, what, a, what an oxymoron. To say you're a Christian and live like the world does. To say you're a child of God and live a life involved in sin. It just should not be. Amen. People think that they can just get God into a box. Uh, they can use him in their time of need. And I refer to, like this, probably most uh, most homes in America, I well, I, I don't know anymore. I It used to be, there was a time that I could make this statement I would be pretty pretty accurate, probably 90-some percent of, uh, uh, of homes in America would have is they would have the Bible. They would have that family Bible. They would have that Bible on the on the coffee table. They would have the Bible on a shelf somewhere to where if somebody started talking about the Bible, somebody would say, well, let me run and get the Bible. And they'd go get it and they'd dust, uh, wipe the dust off of it and they'd try to find something, try to look something up. You know, That used to be that at least every every home in America Almost every home had a Bible, and I don't. I don't believe that's true today, and I, I feel sad about that. Uh, that we don't have every home in America has a Bible. A lot of people do, and it's just that God on a shelf. That's that's all it is to them. They, it's not something they read every day. It's not something that they desire to know more about it. You see, that's God's book, and and He wants you to read it. It, it would be like if you wrote a book or I wrote a book. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a little booklet right now. And, trying to get it all made up where I can give it out to people. And it's called Understanding Revelation. Understanding the Revelation. And, uh, I, man, I've been digging into this, and I'm hope, hoping that I can explain it in such a way that people can understand the book of Revelation. And you know what? I'm, I wrote it. I've spent a lot of time on doing this. I hope people will read it. Well, God spent over 1,400 years speaking through the hearts of men to write the pages of God's holy word. And you know what he hopes? He hopes people will read it. 
because in that Bible are the words of life. In that Bible are the directions and the instructions on how you and I can live through this world and live according to God's standard and be blessed by God. And when it's all said and done, we can arise from this earth to live with him in heaven for glory, in glory, forever and ever and ever. That's what God wants. He doesn't want to just be God in a box or God on a shelf. Amen. And uh, so the church today is following that pattern in many cases, but not all of them. I, I want to say this. I, I, in the last days, it's true that perilous time will come. In the last days, the people will be having a form of godliness, but not denying the power thereof. That's true. But I don't believe it's everybody. Because I look around me. And I know a lot of preachers and a lot of pastors and a lot of different churches. I know a lot of Christians that go to different churches. And you know, some of them, some of them are very committed, dedicated, godly people. They love God with all their heart, and their intent is to serve God continually. Now, some of them aren't. I realize that. But to say, as a whole, America's going down the tube, I don't think so. Yeah, America's in bad trouble. It's because this world gets the publicity. I if all if the world if the church got all the publicity that the world got we'd see a different situation. So it's time that we don't just accept to go along with the ways of the world, amen, but that we rise up, amen, and, and we make that statement uh, that we're, we're still serving God. So therefore, people make that statement uh, while they're not doing right, but uh, they, they, they have the idea if they can just get God to where they want him. But I want to bring it to a different light today. I don't want to put God into my form of life. But I want to get into God's form of life. I want, if anybody think, think needs to be on the shelf, it needs to be me, not God. Amen. So the church today uh, is following a pattern. And it's this. This is the pattern that, that the church should follow. We need the benefit of God. Every child of God needs the benefit of the God. We need to get away from the idea that we have to have all of the excitement of the world to go along with it on the shelf. Dagon, on the shelf, God. In other words, have our life side by side as a Christian with the world. We need to go away, get away from that. So uh, we need to take the worldliness of this world and do away with it and, and say, well, you know what, I'm not going to go that route anymore. I'm going to commit my life totally and completely, wholly unto God. So tonight, I just want to leave you with that thought, you know, that uh, uh, it's not, uh, your relationship with God needs to be something that's an everyday thing, not just from time to time, but you need to uh, surrender to God and be what God wants you to be. And uh, you can play the God, games with God if you want to, but when it comes right down to it, uh, you want a God who can stand on his own two feet not one that falls off a shelf and busts up. You don't need to get a God that you can uh, get into the circle of the world with, but you need a God that you can get into heaven with. Amen. So think about that. Commit your life to God. Before I close tonight, I want to just make you aware of something. In a few weeks, uh, hopefully within a couple of weeks maybe, we'll be starting a study on the Revelation. Hope to have my little booklet printed up, you know, and I'm pretty excited about my first book, it's not even really a book. I'm just joking on that. It's a little booklet. I'm having uh, the local printer printed up for me so we can study together. And uh, it'll be called Understanding Revelation. And that's something I've desired to do for a long, long time. So about a year ago, I, I got into Revelation. I've been reading it over and over and over again. I've taken several, several books of commentaries and other people that are far smarter than I am. And I've taken their thoughts and their ideas and trying to put it into this one book. So together as we study it. So you might want to get ready for that. And when we do this, uh, you'll need your Bible. You'll need your Bible because we're going to go through the Bible, parts of it. We're going to go through this book. And uh, I, I might even make it to where if you want one of the booklets, you can you can write me a, write a letter. Now, I know that's old-fashioned. I can't do it on the Internet. Maybe write me a letter and give me your address and say you would like a book. And uh, if you can send an offering for it, we will. It costs a little bit to print them up. That's not the main issue. Uh, we want you to have that booklet if you would desire to have it. So as we get ready, like I say, hopefully it's not over 
three weeks at the very most that we're in that because I am excited about studying the book of Revelation. I think you will be too. Amen. Why don't you come out and be in service with us this week at the different services. Come Sunday. We're going to have a great time worshiping the Lord together. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Amen.